Hello ladies and gents, it's Hagbard Selene here on another beautiful day and I have a couple of, well, palate cleansers. I thought we'd all been through quite a bit of enough trauma in the last few days and aside from that, a one Gavin McInnes' channel did the video that I had actually already prepared for today. Within it, he had made almost all the same points I had and then, frankly speaking, had done quite a bit more research on the topic because, you know, he has a research team. I will be leaving a link in the description to the Gavin McInnes video. But aside from that, I decided to just do a palate cleanser instead. This is going to be a two-parter that has the first one being a video by one Kimberly William Crenshaw, another university professor in critical race theory, after which we shall follow up with a brief explanation on exactly what critical race theory is via the Frankfurt School. So with that, I hope you guys enjoy this, and it should be fun. I know it's a very small point, but anytime someone puts a gender or a race in front of another title, it, it just makes me want to laugh now. Beyond that point, the word omega traditionally means last, or worst, or lowest. So what do we do? Good question. I feel like I'm starting to lose track of that myself, but I also feel like I'm thinking about something a little bit different than you. I don't think we have to have huge, big solutions. There are some things that we can do. One thing is, we can always train ourselves to ask the other question. Note her language usage there. She seems quite interested in training people in society. I see the sexism in this, but do I see the racism in it? Of course, no matter what, it must be both, am I right? I see the homophobia in this, but do I see the classism in it? That feels like a stretch even to me. It's like you're trying to avoid making it all about race. Just telling ourselves that we need to ask additional questions sometimes opens up possibilities that we had never seen. That is true. When one takes in new data, it is possible to see things one has never seen before. Have you considered looking at the data as to whether you have any way to verify this data that you see you have collected, or whether your theory is even falsifiable on the face of it? As in, is there even a possibility that there are times when these are not factors in human behavior? Because if so, then you have to start finding out when that is and falsify parts of your own theory. Even if that is only on an individual basis. Because I know as much as you like talking about groups of people, not all of the people that you group together identify as part of these groups. What we have to be prepared to do is to take the history that we know about and repudiate that history and move to a different awareness, a different politics, a different consciousness about women. So let's just sprinkle in some light advocating for history revisionism. That's always good. We can celebrate some of our victories, but it's important for us to learn. It's important for us to move away from images of women's rights that look exclusive and exclusionary and to different ideas about how inclusion is supposed to look. You'll at least admit that you've won a lot of these battles and now you're just further saying that it'll never be enough. We've learned that already about your type. It's, it's never enough. Right. Now, at the end of the day, I want to suggest that we fantasize. I actually find it somewhat refreshing and shocking that you're willing to admit that what you're about to say is completely fantasy. It is fantastical as hell. It's frankly ridiculous, but most of the time your type of person likes to think that these things are applicable. I kind of think you're doing a John Lennon, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try, and all these other good social commentaries he made at the time, but a lot of the problem with this movement is the lack of reality, the lack of pragmatism you people apply to your theory. But I'll just let you continue. I may just be overstepping here. And as long as we're fantasizing 
about boys not learning the message of absorbing uh, violence, why not wish for a world where children don't learn that racial inclusion, exclusion, is normative and okay? Well, luckily, that's a point that they've been hammering home in children's TV shows, children's books, and children's movies for about 45 years. So I wouldn't be super concerned about that there, love. Where Americans don't learn that their security is primary above all. Sure, sure, because we're the only nation that currently or ever feels that way. That is not the standard feeling of a nation. We're not out for our own security or anything. That's, that's abhorrent. How dare we? How dare we wish to be secure? There are people around the world that aren't secure. How dare you ask for the privilege of being secure? It's disgusting, you white privileged bastards. Where atrocities against civilians all over the world done in the name of our way of life is acceptable. Well, you heard her, Americans. Apparently, we shouldn't feel anything whatsoever for killing civilians. We shouldn't even try and mitigate it. We shouldn't be shamed by it at all because she's saying it's the norm. So apparently, it isn't the norm to try not to kill civilians. No, that's, we're totally out to kill civilians, apparently. Now that's our, that's our goal. I, this is complete madness. As long as we are imagining and fantasizing about a female president, why not fantasize about a truly intersectional feminist politics? One of those things was specific and achievable. One of those things was vague and odd. What exactly is truly intersectional politics? Oh, never mind. You'd have one answer. Someone else would have another. You guys would start infighting and I'd eat popcorn. As long as we're imagining a world without war, why don't we imagine a world without prisons? <laughs> Listen, lady, I've been to prison. Trust me, we need prisons. Some of those people need to be somewhere that is not in open society. And as for no wars, come on, really. Nobody wants war, but... You can't tell all the sides not to go to war at once. If someone else starts shit and you just say, I, I, I don't want to go to war, it sounds like such a scary and bad idea. They just kill you or occupy you. Did you not study history at all? As long as we are attacking the military industrial complex, it's drain on our resources, it's play on our fears, it's endless demand for human lives, why don't we attack the prison industrial complex, which depletes our resources, feeds on our fears, and devours lives in the very same way? Yes, yes, the same vague talking points that I've heard from you pedagogues since I was a child. If any of you, even one of you, could stand up and say that you had even a remote solution, or alteration, or slow way of going from the economic systems and the way that these things are supported, perhaps I could talk to you again. But as it were, you guys just have this vague notion that you have to tear it down. I have some real basic questions. What do we do with all of the engineers currently working for Lockheed Martin, Boeing, General Electric, and several of the other companies that are part of the military industrial complex? I agree perhaps something needs to be done and this should be discussed, but what do we do with those employees? And while we're on that very basic topic, what do we do with prison guards if the prisons were to be shrunk down significantly? Even that I'll accept, because you're never going to do away with prisons as an asinine concept. But to shrink them down to just the major crimes and to have some sort of rehabilitation facilities otherwise, we can have a discussion about that, but we need to have a discussion with what we do with the prison guards who have been there for 10 or 15 years and possess no other skills, and what do we do with the prison towns, the townships that popped up to support the people that work at the prison, because prisons tend to have been built in isolated locations and then little townships pop up around them. So we're talking about something of an economic scale along with what would have been shutting down the coal mines in West Virginia has done. So what do we do now? We've shut down many industries. You're just talking about shutting down another one. We need to have a discussion with where to go 
from there. But you're not even remotely prepared to do that because you're an ideologue. And the next video will describe where all of this got started. The single cell that started the cancer that we're now dealing with today. The Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. Succinctly, it is described as an anti-positivist social theory heavily influenced by Marx. Also, it tends to draw quite heavily upon exegesis and hermeneutics. And sadly, that just links it back to religion, because these are two practices that were essentially founded by the Abrahamic traditions. Talmudic Judaism, all those fun things. So let's see the roots of the Frankfurt theory, as described by two practitioners of that theory. Let's go. Nope, I'm allergic to intros. In 1930, uh, Max Horkheimer took over the directorship of the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt, Germany. At the absolute root of it, Max Horkheimer was simply a Marxist philosopher. Put simply, the original aim of critical theory was to analyze the true significance of the quote-unquote ruling understandings generated in bourgeois society in order to show how they misrepresented actual human interaction in the real world and in doing so function to justify or legitimize the domination of the people by capitalism. This is taken from Wikipedia, just so I'm not accused of plagiarism. The more interesting portion of this is that he himself argued that the social scientist is caught up in his own social environment and influenced heavily by it. Ironically, being influenced heavily by Marxism without realizing that it in itself was the avant-garde theory of its time. So, it's very interesting to see that in a self-reflective ideology, it lacked self-reflection. And this really begins the period of what we come to call the Frankfurt School, um, or Frankfurt School Critical Theory. Uh, which was an interdisciplinary intellectual movement uh, that drew on philosophy and sociology and psychology and economics. This is true, but the labels you've given this movement have a stilted understanding. It drew on postmodern philosophy, it drew on Marxist sociology and economics, and it drew on Freudian psychology. All things that have mm, questionable standings nowadays. Um, and several other disciplines um, out of the conviction that this was the only way that the sort of questions or the crises of the day could be properly addressed. And you said this school was founded in the 1930s. Yeah, that turned out well for Europe, didn't it? And we associate the Frankfurt School with figures both in and out of the Institute for Social Research. So people like Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno, people like uh, Eric Fromm and Friedrich Pollock, but also figures like Walter Benjamin and many others. Yes, yes, you're going about as in-depth as the Wikipedia page, although, <laughs> frankly, a little bit less. So in this class, we're going to be focusing on the writings of Horkheimer, Adorno, and Benjamin. While Horkheimer and Adorno are interesting figures, and I would advise everyone to look into them on their own, they're basically just the beginning of this whole cultural Marxism game. It's actually the last person I would like to focus on for just a moment. I believe this last figure they're referring to to be Selah ben Ibi. Now, she is a Turkish-born philosopher that is a quote-unquote democratic theorist. In reality, apparently, that is the technical title for someone who is a multiculturalist. She believes in the utter pluralism and that everybody is uh, equal and it's fundamentally all okay and that if we all worked in a city it would work out because that's working so well. Although there are absolutely no examples as the article itself dictates, she's still saying it's of course not something we shouldn't strive for. She is the one that is rooting this for this particular school of thought. She's the one who's got this into the Boston school of thought. She was educated at Yale. She's part of the American school of thought. That's why she's being emphasized. She's also a, apparently a strong advocate for porous borders. A truly lovely idea. Am I right? All my viewers from Europe, those porous borders doing good for you? Good economically, good socially? 
good culturally everything feeling everything feeling all right over there how's that pluralism doing in particular, we're going to be reading uh, a text co-authored by Horkheimer and Adorno from 1944 called The Dialectic of Enlightenment. It's only reasonable that you would be covering that book, considering it was written by two of the founding figures, and it allows you to get a two-for-one deal. However, it's interesting that they coined the term, and this is their term, counter-enlightenment. Essentially, the combined Nietzschean philosophy and Marxist ideology, then you cook it at a guilt-riddled reactionary temperature about equal to the ovens at Auschwitz. The Enlightenment is this notion from the 17th and 18th century in Europe, which basically claims that if we could just get beyond superstition and myth and religion, that we're going to be able to use our human reason and rational capacities to master ourselves, to master nature, and to be able to create this rationally ordered, perfectly just, peaceful society. That's a bit of a straw man. It's indeed true that some Enlightenment thinkers believed in something of a rational utopia, but being rational thinkers most realized that human nature came into play entirely too easily. So they wouldn't have held that up to be a, an ideal that we're headed towards. What most of them argued is that through the casting away of superstitious thought and the reason and science aspect, we could live in a much better world, a much safer world, a world with better medical science, a world with better general technology. But of course, you're going to focus on a handful of incidences that we all know were absolutely atrocious. We all know we're probably not the best case scenario for that. Nobody says that the Nazis used reason to gain power except for people like you. The use of the atom bomb is debatable on a military standpoint and from the actual understanding we had of what an atom bomb was capable of when we used it. However, you using the Nazis is just disingenuous bullshittery. So the question that Adorno and Horkheimer were faced with, writing in 1944, is how is it that we get from these Enlightenment ideas, Enlightenment values, to totalitarianism, to the Holocaust, to the atom bomb? See? See? And the interesting thing about Adorno and Horkheimer's critique is it ju doesn't focus on fascism and Stalinism as sort of epiphenomenon of the Enlightenment, but rather looks at key aspects of the modern condition, things like the advancement of science, things like uh, mass culture and what they call the culture industry. Uh what they mean is the oppression by modern man by stuff. Um, the atomization of the individual. What they've done there is borrow a term from existentialism, and it's a term that refers to the loneliness, the angst, and the isolation that is possible in modern society. However, technology has advanced significantly since then, and I would argue has actually nullified that, if not completely, then it has at least allowed for quite a bit more opportunities to feel interconnected. Hence the internet. Hence social media. All kinds of phenomenon that we can associate with our society today as being a key part of the unfolding of this dialectic of enlightenment that ends in such horror. Look at the language use there. Ends in such horror. It simply must. It's not that it was twisted in the instance of World War II and specifically the rise of the Nazi party, and to say that they use reason and rationale is again dishonest as fuck. But no, it's, it's not that at all. So in this class, we're going to be interrogating not only these texts in the context of their history, but how they play out uh, read today. And yet, ironically, when you say interrogating in this case, you don't actually mean looking at those texts and seeing if there's something critical to be said about them. You mean whether they can interrogate society. But I'd like to thank you guys for making this video because it does indeed just further prove that cultural Marxism has infiltrated the schools. That's it for me today, ladies and gentlemen. As I mentioned in my last video, I'm quite harried this week, and as I mentioned in the beginning of this, my video, which I had already edited and prepared, was essentially swiped out from under me Mike Gavin. Not blaming him, he's, uh, he's on the ball, and I wasn't, so, so be it. Anyway, thanks for getting through that with me. 
I will see all of you on Saturday, and I hope you had fun. Stay safe out there. Goodbye.